You're watching Sports Beat. It's now official. Boyan Bogdanovich is a member of the Utah Jazz. The Mike Conley trade became official on Saturday. And Conley didn't waste any time getting here. He arrived here Saturday, ready to check out his new digs. This is cool. He took a tour of the city. Not the city of Utah, the city of Salt Lake. <laughs> Checked out the state capitol, took in the view of the Salt Lake Valley. He also had a chance to meet jazz fans and take pictures. He looks forward to his new challenge in his career. To get, get traded somewhere, you know, you couldn't have been traded to a better situation as far as um, the culture and the, the abilities that the young guys have on the team. I mean, Donovan is a star in the league. Rudy's a star in the league. Um, you know, Joe, it's just going to be a lot of fun to be able to, to take the court with those guys and battle every night. Already a star in Utah. Running Utes legend DeLon Wright has a new NBA home, the Dallas Mavericks and Memphis Grizzlies. They've worked out a deal, a sign and trade that will send DeLon to Dallas. It's a three year, $29 million contract with the Mavericks. They'll get a chance to start on this team along with Luka Doncic and Kristaps Porzingis. DeLon had his first career triple double against the Mavs last season, a career best 26 points, 14 assists, 10 boards. In fact, he had back to back triple doubles, both against Dallas. He had three total triple doubles in just 26 games with Memphis last year. If you can't beat him, sign him. <laughs> DeLon's former college teammate Kyle Kuzma had to chime in on his friend's new deal. Kyle saying, hey, dinner's on you, DeLon. Yeah, yeah I would say so. Damian Lillard signed a Supermax extension this week. It's a four-year extension worth $196 million. He'll be in Portland through the 24-25 season. Dame spoke publicly about his decision to sign the Supermax on Saturday. This being the you know, the place that I started, the team that, that drafted me, and just so much has been invested with our team. I think we've built something special. The environment that we've created is something that I've been a part of, and it's something that I want to continue to be a part of. It's only right that, you know, this is where I, I continue to, you know, to play. Okay, how many of you stayed up until midnight Friday? Stayed up I way did. past midnight. <laughs> where were you when news broke that Kawhi Leonard made his decision? Yeah, for me, I had just walked in the door from work, and my phone just started going <laughs> nuts. Yeah, it was a decision that will shape this league championship chase next season, wrapping up what was a wild week in free agency in the NBA. We all waited for Kawhi Leonard to make his decision. It finally happened at midnight on Friday. What it do, baby? He stunned many by choosing the Clippers a four-year, $142 million max contract, $50 million less than he would have made staying in Toronto. Then this Woj bomb dropped. He wasn't going to the Clips alone. In order to get Kawhi to commit, the Clippers completed a blockbuster deal with the Oklahoma City Thunder that brought Paul George to L.A. We coming home. In exchange for Paul George, the Clippers paid a price sending impressive young point guard Shea Gilgis-Alexander, Danilo Gallinari, five first-round picks, four of them unprotected, and two pick swaps. After getting rejected by Kawhi, <laughs> the Lakers needed to use their cap space to fill out the rest of their roster around LeBron, AD, and Kyle Kuzma. It started with Danny Green, two years, $30 million. Then the Lakers added DeMarcus Cousins on a one-year, $3.5 million deal. The Lakers also re-signed Rajon Rondo on a two-year deal, and Alex Caruso stays with the Lakers, two years, $5.5 million. The Lakers also keep Contavious Caldwell-Pope and JaVale McGee. And DeLon Wright caps off a wild weekend, three-year, $29 million deal with the Mavericks. That Knicks dumpster fire is still <laughs> raging hot. Now that Kawhi has made his decision and the dust has settled, we can take a look at the Western Conference and determine who we think is the favorite to win the West and reach the NBA Finals. So, Sam, I'll start. Yeah. This is my list okay. of who I think will make the playoffs next season in the West. I have the Clippers as the favorite. Sorry, Jazz fans, just being honest. The Jazz, I believe, are right behind them, though. Jumping over the Rockets. I think they're better than the Rockets now. This may surprise some of you. I have the Blazers and Nuggets ahead of the Lakers. Mm -hmm. LeBron, Anthony Davis, and Kyle Kuzma. A formidable threesome, but I just don't think they have enough shooting and depth to move past the first five. Golden State will struggle without Clay but still get enough from Steph to stay in the race. It'll be scary in the playoffs when Clay comes back. And I think San Antonio finds a way to get that eighth spot. Yeah. But, man, I struggle with this because I think the Pelicans and the Kings could end their playoff streak. Well, I have the same eight teams. We do have some similarities. So okay. here's my way too early list of playoff teams. I think over an 82-game season, the Nuggets, with their depth and talent, they have the best what? chance to win the most games 
over the course of a season. So the number one seed, yeah. I don't think they'll go far in the playoffs, yeah. though. I'm just saying. The Denver Nuggets? <laughs> yeah, that, uh, okay. So I think they can win uh, 55 to 60 games. The Jazz with the third seed, uh, the Clippers in between them. Portland with the fourth seed. I think the Jazz win 55-ish games or so. Uh, Golden State fifth for, you know, what they lost. And Thompson out for much of the year. I don't yeah. think they do much better than that. Of course, uh, interesting. You got yeah. the Rockets taking the Rockets. a dip. I do have them taking. I don't think they mm. did a whole lot to improve their situation. You think Chris Paul off-season. finishes the season in Houston? That might not happen either. I right? don't think so either. And are they going to make a deal that they're, you know all the rumors about where where Russell Westbrook may end up? Is Houston one of those spots? Who knows? So possibly interesting. All right, we'll see. We got this on tape. Yeah. Denver Nuggets winning the West next year. The Jazz. They were on the court today against the Heat in summer league. Willie Reed. Yeah. Banks at home on the jump hook and one. Led the team with 14 points, 12 boards. A bit later, Justin Wright Foreman hit a three as well, uh, three of his seven. The game, though, the highlight is seeing the Jazz guys there watching. Uh, Mike Conley, of course. He had high praises for Donovan Mitchell during this game, too. Just, uh, you know, trying to get the most out of him. You know, he's he's a, a bright young star in this league. Uh, the, the sky's the limit. I know that. You know, we're going to do as much as we can to, to help him and, and become who he can become. And I think he's going to be a, a big reason why we'll be really good this year. All right, it's time to pay some bills when we come back. We got a lot coming up. Tribute to Derek Favors. <laughs> Those highlights, man. <laughs> Those for the fans. From the day he was traded to the Jazz to a crazy comeback against Giannis and the Bucks, we look back at the best from Derek Favors, eight and a half years in a Jazz uniform. I want the players at Utah Valley to play against the best competition nationwide. It's a new era of basketball just beginning at Utah Valley. What can we expect from Mark Madsen and his Wolverines this year? He sits down with us after the break. Watching Sports Beat. The Utah Jazz got better this offseason, but doing so required them to make a very difficult decision. They had to say goodbye to one of the most popular players in franchise history. Yep. <clears throat> Derek Favors, the third in franchise history in rebounds, seventh in blocks, tenth in games played. He's going to be loved by Jazz fans forever, there's no doubt. Here's a look back at some of his best moments in a Jazz uniform. I'm a Jazz musician, came from Utah, Derek Favors. Again, the pick and roll. Oh! He's only getting better and better. The Favors, oh, he goes to the rim hard. They know Favors, two hands it. Favors takes a strong Two-hander, nice. Oh, Favors jams on two guys. They were on a cut. Nice kick to the side. Oh, the two-hander. Welcome to Derek Favors' highlight reel, Mr. Durant. And he gets it right back again. Oh, my. Derek Favors oh, just a monster out there tonight. Is it Halloween? He is the man. Oh, Favors. Two hands it. Oh, 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 my. Extra pass on the outside. And Favors takes it away. Big time block. And knocked out of bounds. It's going to be Utah ball. No look pass. Put that one on the reel. Baby, that's beautiful. <laughs> Those highlights, man. <laughs> Those for the fans. It's a scary thought. Derek Favors is only going to get better. Favors out in front to the rack. Two hands up high. Flushing it down. Your player inside. Favors. Wow. Winding up. And slamming it in. Baseline. It's blocked. The putback. Derek Favors. Only rattled the rim. Timeout LA. The best putback. Jazz send franchise point guard Darren Williams to the New Jersey Nets for former all-star guard Devin Harris, fifth player taken in the 2004 draft. Rookie Derek Favors, 6'10", 246-pound power forward. Great Jordan, Derek Favors has that potential as well. He plays not a team. That's a hand to pick up. They'll go to Favors, Len again defensively, Favors, and one. I just want to get stronger, be a little bit more explosive, and you know, just work on my conditioning. I made sure I came to play tonight and um, 
got win. Energy Arena favors on a long ball. Down deep goes Faves. Side favors the deep catch. You know, the grass not always green on the other side. No playoffs this year without Derek. Uh, no playoff advancement the two previous years. His impact and willingness to, you know, not play as many minutes but still be impactful. I'm happy in the situation that I'm in, in the position that I'm in. Um, I think it's good for me and the organization, so you know, we'll see what happens. Favors catches, Favors dunks. Here's Favors on a stretch three-point. Oh, hits it. <laughs> D Faves is just, if you touch him, you're going to be burnt right now. But I tell you on the Jazz, there's one in rhythm, and that's Derek Favors. Yeah, we are going to miss Derek Favors. You probably remember him as the Mad Dog, leading Stanford to a Final Four, or perhaps you know him for his phenomenal dancing skills after winning an NBA championship with the Lakers. Yeah, but now we know him as coach. Mark Madsen is here to lead the Utah Valley Wolverines in a new and exciting direction. Basically went straight from your playing days right into coaching. Yes. It, was there ever a doubt, or did you always know, or, or was there a moment that clicked one day that you thought, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a coach someday? Yeah, yeah. No, I think for me, <clears throat> I was reading John Wooden, John Wooden's book. They call me coach. Yeah. And just hearing the way he discussed coaching in his book, hearing the experiences that he had, it made, it made me want to pursue that as a, as a job, to help players become better, to help players achieve their potential. And so to be able to come here as the head coach, it was just such a great opportunity. And I could not be more excited to be here. Yeah, what led you to, to the Utah Valley job? You know, what about it was, was most appealing to you and made you feel like, you know, this is where I want to get my first head coaching game? I look at the tradition of, of Utah Valley, starting with Dick Hunsaker, going to Coach Mark Pope, the players that have come through here. If, if you look even here in this practice court where we are now, you look on the walls, you've got, you got Ronnie Price, you have Travis Hansen, you, you, know, you, you have Ryan Toulson, you have some tremendous players and people that have come through UVU. Yeah, and it's, it's almost like uh, not only is it you know, a new start for you, but almost like a new start for the program. Obviously, when, when Coach Pope left, some of the some of the good players that were here left as well. So, I mean, talk about the challenges of having to kind of, I guess, restructure a, a roster and a team. Well, I, I think it's it's understandable. Anytime there's a coaching change, there's going to be transfers. There's going to be players going to other schools. We, we experienced that here. I think we had seven or eight guys that were on the roster last year that have transferred other places. And that's okay. If anything, I think it should be that way. Players should have the freedom to be able to, to transfer and move. Um, consequently, we've gone out and signed a lot of new players. Um, I was really happy to be able to retain the five returners coming back from last year's team. Great players. But I'm also excited to have brought in six or seven new players. And we're going to kind of mesh everyone together, and we're going to have a great team. What is that, the, the world of this, this uh, transfer uh, portal like now? Obviously, you're able to to reach in and, and find some experienced players at the Division One level to come over and help you out, like like Emmanuel and uh, and some of the other guys that, that you brought over as well. Uh, that, that's obviously got to be a little bit of a help, right? Well, I think the transfer portal is good for everyone. But but number one, it's good for the student athletes themselves because if if they've invested heavily into a program, into a school, and if they've paid their dues, they, they should have the chance to explore a new opportunity, get a graduate degree somewhere. Um, and, and, and have a change of scenery. They, they've worked hard, they deserve it, and, and they put the time in. Uh, um, is there, just, just out of curiosity, with, with all the experience you've had, you know, at Stanford as a player, in the NBA as a player, coaching in the NBA, uh, the, the year you coached at Stanford, what, what do you draw upon the most? That, or is it little bits of all of that, all those experiences? I, I think for me, you draw on a lot of different things. I draw on, the experiences and the style of every coach I've ever played for. And then I draw on my teammates, my past teammates in the college level, at the pro level, because you, you just learn so much playing this game. And then I've coached the game for close to a decade now. And <clears throat> for example, in the NBA, we might prepare for 100 games in a year. And so you're going through intensive prep 100 times. All types of different offensive systems. In the NBA, think about the Warriors system versus the Portland Trailblazers versus San Antonio. All three systems are, are vastly different. And so you, you learn how to dissect and dive deep into, into X's and O's.
That's great. Well, um, we, we talked a little bit about some of the guys that have, that have come over. Uh, I believe uh, seven players, I think, right? Is that about right that you've added? Six, uh, yeah, six or seven? Yeah, six or seven, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, first of all, I, I want to ask you a little bit about Craig Woodbury. Yep. Uh, he was a top 100 recruit, I believe, out of high yep. school. He, he had that a, a little bit of experience there at UNLV. What about him just excites you a lot to have him over here? Trey, Wood, Trey Woodbury is a phenomenal shooter, but he's not just a shooter. Trey Woodbury can put the ball down. He can finish at the rim. He's an athlete. I mean, Trey Woodbury will get up and, and dunk on people. Um, and then his decision-making is, is something that differentiates him. There's plenty of shooters out there that, can, that are just a one-trick pony. Trey can not only shoot, he can play make, he can put the ball down, he can handle on the pick and roll. And he's a great young man. He's a great young man, so really excited to have him here. How about, uh, how about Emmanuel? You know, obviously uh, a guy who's had three years experience at Akron, he comes over here, he, he basically, the way he told us, this is that he's got one year left, he's going to put it all on the line. I mean, what excites you about him? Well, a lot of things excite me about Emmanuel. Uh, number one, his leadership. Uh, number two, he, has, he can change a game just by walking onto the court. You know, if you, if you study his statistics, Emmanuel's had games where he's, he's blocked six shots. Well, when you block a shot, it does more than just erasing that field goal attempt. There's a psychological impact against the other team. Mm -hmm. And there's a momentum factor where your whole team can get momentum. Hey, Emmanuel just got a block. Let's get out and run the break. Let's get out and get an open three. Or let's dish it back to E-Man in for a dunk. That's awesome. And that, I mean, when you think of, of toughness, is that, is that one word that could describe the guy? I mean, obviously, he, he went through a lot with his, his heart surgery and stuff like that in his past, I mean, uh, to come back. Yeah, the, the word toughness is, is one of many words that could describe Emmanuel. Um, the words that come to my mind are toughness, character, skilled, explosive, and, and more than anything else, Emmanuel is not only a great player, but he's a great young man. Well, so we've talked about those guys. Who else, I mean, should, should be on our radar uh, for this upcoming season? I mean, I think every single transfer we brought in has, has huge potential. You look at Brandon Morley coming in from the University of Utah. Here's, here's a seven-footer who can step out and shoot the three. Um, how many seven-footers out there are there in NCAA Division I that can stretch the court out all the way? I think Brandon's a great defensive rebounder. Um, you, you, look at, you, you look at Zach Mogbo, who's not here. He, he's a rugged, physical, 6'7", physical specimen who also thinks the game. I mean, he, he's got a, a really, he, he's smart out there, he's tough, and he's rugged. Um, from, from the wing standpoint, you've got J.J. Overton. He can play three positions. J.J. can play the point guard, he can play the two, he can play the three. He, he's a great decision maker coming off the pick and roll. He can see over the defenses. Uh, he can finish at the rim with explosiveness. You, you've got Fardaz, who will be sitting out this year, but, but Fardaz is about 6'11", probably 250, 260, who's at Mercer. Fardaz averaged five rebounds in 14 minutes a game. You, you do the math on that. Um, Fardaz, as, as he continues to work on his game, he's gonna be able to control the paint from a rebounding standpoint. And guys will bounce off of him. Um, and then to have Jake Hesse come in, J Jake Hesse committed to UVU last October, I believe. And, and Jake is a very athletic 2-3 man. He'll hit the three, he'll, he'll attack the rim, and, and, and he'll, he's one also who will who'll go up there and try to dunk on you. So what would you say, um, I'm sure there's, there's a, a few challenges, but what would you say are some of the biggest challenges of, of basically trying to kickstart a program in your first year? Well, when we had so many players leave the program, right. and again, that's to be expected. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes when there's, when there's a coaching change, sometimes the entire roster gets overhauled. And so th that was to be expected. Um, you know, I recruited all the guys that stayed. Every player in the program, I wanted to stay. We were able to keep five. I, I, most rosters have 15 guys, so we were able to keep five, and I'm so grateful that those guys stayed. But now we got to go out. We've, we've filled six or seven spots. We still have a few more spots we, we need to fill. And so it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge to have that much turnover and have all the guys come together. But I'll tell you this. Our players are coming together. They're working hard yeah. every day in this gym as a team collectively and on their own. Sometimes I've been in here late at night, early in the morning. Guys are in here working, yeah. working on their game, perfecting their craft. 
what, what would you say are the expectations then for year one of Mark Madsen era at Utah Valley? What would you say that the goals, expectations are? Well, let me say this. We want to play one of the most competitive schedules in the nation. And I think when we announce it shortly, I think, I think yourself and, and the, the greater Utah area is going to be very, very pleased with the schedule that we release. And, and I'm also speaking to future recruits. Um, I want the players at Utah Valley to play against the best competition nationwide. And, and that will be an announcement that will come out shortly in the next probably uh, three to six weeks. And so we want this to be a school where we're playing the best, we're developing the best, and we're competing um, for the best. Well, they both had All-American legs at the U, but how do Andy Phillips and Tom Hackett compare on the golf course? That's coming up next on the Hallowed Grounds. Back in their playing days with the Utes, Tom Hackett and Andy Phillips were best friends, forming one of the best special teams units in the country. Well, tonight, we turn these former teammates and friends into competitors out on the golf course, Hackett vs. Phillips, in this edition of the Hallowed Grounds. The Hallowed Grounds. Brought to you by Siegfried and Jensen. We like Ronnie Mack around here. Big dog. Big dog Ronnie. Big dog Ron. Welcome into this week's episode of the Hallowed Grounds. I'm your host, Tom Hackett. This week, Andy Phillips joins me. We're at Willow Creek Country Club. About to play. Well, we're changing it up. We're about to play the par 3th. Uh, and the reason we're changing it up is because Andy, who happens to do a podcast with myself, Special Forces Gang, check it out wherever you find your podcast is not eligible, not eligible for the sensational prizes. So big thank you to Bushnell, to you and to golf. We love and appreciate you. So does Andy. He's just a little bitter that he is not eligible to win these magnificent well, prizes. Well, it's almost a sure thing for me today, Tom. There's a lot on the line. Winner takes all. Pride, you'll never hear about it anywhere else. Andy, you ready? Yeah, glutes are activated. Let's Went play some golf. Stop talking. Let's go. Yeah, she's gone. <laughs> no, she's in the water. Get off this tee box, Andy. You're not deserving. So you have four kids, Andy, all uh, within four years of each other. Yeah. So you get how many hours sleep a night? I wake up at 4.20, get a pump in, get a run in, because everyone's sleeping, you know, at that time. Do you know what that is, Tom? No, I thought he was talking about like injecting, pumping something into his veins. I don't know. Oh! Oh, I hit the golf cart. I say we take this another hole. We can get one more. Tom says he's changed his swing up uh, and slowed things down. He's pretending like he really knows what he's talking about. A little match play. Hey, can style. you shut up back there so I can better <laughs> swing? Oh, no. Looks about right. What do you do for days. a living? Uh, I pump iron. No, you <laughs> idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Just doing some landscaping over there. Yeah. <laughs> hey, where do you want this in your bag? <laughs> <laughs> Get that out of here. <laughs> Holy cow, Andy. Just off the green. No big deal. About killed Tom. No big deal. Best of three. Because he's not eligible for prizes. Tom and I met actually for the first time we were in the Utah football indoor and Tom had this long hair. He had a lot of hair back then. I know. Long story short, I, th I thought he was coming for my job, um, but he was really just a punter. Andy and I ha uh, became close because, and here's the short story, neither of us had played the game before. So we were both trying to figure out what on earth we were doing playing this game called college football. But yeah, that's kind of the short story. <laughs> Listen to our podcast for the long story. Kind of channel my my inner Tony Fee now here. Right by the pin. Thanks, Tony. Andy, final words as the winner of this uh, of this uh, golfing. I'm just business as usual. Um, you know, I think Tom's beat me twice in his life. Uh, just want to give a shout out That's to. Uh, for you. Um. Hi, I'm Lindsay Myers from Willow Creek Country Club. I started playing golf as a kid, two to three years old. Uh, my grandpa, uh, who managed a golf course in Beaver, Utah, 
cut down some clubs for me. They were the, probably the old wood persimmon clubs. Um, so he and my grandpa managed the golf course and I grew up around it and it's, it's a small town so there's not much else to do. Eventually I um, got a college scholarship at Weaver State University and um, continued to play ever since. The reason why I started was probably to drive the golf cart. So with my kids or kids that I help coach and, and uh, mentor, I always let them drive the cart, uh, whether it's sitting on my lap or um, actually letting them put, push on the gas as soon as they can reach. Uh, I think that, that helps keep it interesting. Um, and also helping show that it, there's a lot of success in golf and failure. Um, if you fail, you know you can come back and play the next day and, and probably will be successful. Hi, I'm Steve Williams. I'm with Cleveland Golf Strixon. Uh, I've been the rep here for about 12 years. We make a wedge for everybody. We make a wedge uh, like you're used to seeing, uh, a blade wedge, which we'll see used on tour and such. Um, I mean, really, probably the best wedge in the game, in my opinion. But on the other end of the spectrum, we make a, a, a wedge called the Smart Soul. This is the most forgiving wedge out there. This is kind of for your max game improvement player or a beginner golfer. Um, so we, we just want to let you know we have something for everybody. Best of luck to all the competitors playing in the 121st Utah State Amateur Championship up at Soldier Hollow. The tournament starts on Monday and runs through Saturday. Check out UGA.org for all the latest tee times and pairings. A look ahead to some action this week around the state. The men's Eagle Mountain Senior Amateur at Eagle Mountain Golf Course will be on July 12th. The mixed Canyon Breeze Night Golf is also on July 12th at Canyon Breeze Golf Course. The mixed White Pine Couples will be a day later on July 13th at White Pine Golf Course. And the men's U.S. Amateur Qualifier on July 15th at Alpine Country Club. We promise the next segment on Sports Beat will be a knockout. The great clips of the week are up next after this. Great clips of the week. This right here is 100% pure number one overall pick, Muscle. Zion Williamson scored 11 points in just nine minutes in his summer league debut. The Pelicans, well, they've put him on the shelf for the rest of the summer, though, after he did bruise his knee in the game there. Former Lone Peak Knight Frank Jackson not on the shelf. These boys have a breakout season for New Orleans. He showed off his athleticism on Friday night with his drive and dunk. He scored 30 points in 24 minutes, including five for nine from the three-point line. Frank's going to have a big year in New Orleans. Best dunk of the Salt Lake City Summer League right here, maybe. Congrats, Justin Wright Foreman. You earned it, buddy. Look at that. This is a little guy too, right? Getting up, thrown down with the left hand. This rookie from Hofstra, he can rise. All right, Jarrell Brantley capped off Salt Lake City Summer League in style, the statement dunk against the Spurs. Brantley's been impressive this summer so far, but he was pulled out early tonight with tightness in his hamstring. I like him, though. I might have a chance to uh, be on the roster in the fall. Oh, what's this? Another great play from the NBA Summer League in Las Vegas. Jordan Seibert to the Atlanta Hawks goes behind the back. Bruno Fernando finishes the play the right way. That is just sorcery. <laughs> uh, this is one of the more humorous events of the week. The sprinklers going off during the mixed doubles match here at Wimbledon. Sent the players sc scrambling. Just trying to get her purse, you know, trying to stay dry. Oh, dear. This year marks the 30th anniversary of Seinfeld. To celebrate, New York Mets fan Jerry Seinfeld threw out the first pitch this week at a Mets game. Jerry's 65 years old. Ladies and gentlemen, with a sidearm delivery, throws a curveball for a strike. He's no pirate. <laughs> that pitch was gold, Jerry. Gold. Well, this here was pretty scary. Angels catcher Jonathan Lucroy. Ouch. Yeah, he col uh, the collision there at the plate. Astros outfielder Jake Marisnik uh, collides at home there. Lucroy had to be carted off the field, sent to a local hospital. He had a, a CT scan. Evaluated for possible concussion and a broken no nose. This is, I mean, he's had that happen to him multiple times in his career. Yeah. And uh, doesn't look fun. Well, I hope he uh, bounces back well. Hey, tomorrow, I'm headed to Vegas. The Jazz will introduce Mike Conley and Boyan Bogdanovich at a press conference tomorrow. We'll have coverage tomorrow. See you then.